Okay, maybe we could start. So, well, I will start by uh, reminding you what uh, we are doing. Um, we are uh, after anomalous dimensions of local operators. We have local operators that are single trace operators, which are constructed of various fields. So, um, for example, a simple one is uh, this operator. And we are trying to extract uh, their anomalous dimensions. So of course, for this particular case, we know the anomalous dimension. You remember why we knew the anomalous dimension for this one? For all values of the coupling? VPS, yeah, this one was VPS. We know for this particular case, the anomalous dimension was two. But uh, for more complicated cases where uh, we have C's and uh, well, C's and W's and other C's and other W's, etc., will have more complicated anomalous dimensions. And um, we, uh, we're we gave a strategy for what we're going to do. We're going to take this large J limit, and then we're going to compute quantities only in this large lim uh, J limit, and then we are going to take J to be small. And J, I, I remind you, was the number of uh, of fields we have here. And what we, what we like to do is to continuously interpolate between the picture where we have weak coupling, uh, where we have a bunch of gluons or particles moving around, and the strong coupling picture. Now notice that um, if we have that simple operator like the trace C squared, and we consider the two-point function, which is uh, one way uh, we could extract the anomalous dimension by considering the two-point function, we have, uh, so the planar diagrams in the free theory are easy to write. Uh, we have two fields propagating up and down. Um, and then, uh, so that's the weak coupling picture. And the strong coupling picture is a similar picture where we have a closed string uh, moving between these two operators, right? And so somehow we are supposed to build uh, this closed string wall shed. But here we have only just two gluons. And as we start uh, increasing the coupling, we have other particles propagating. And that's supposed to build up the wall shed. Now, one of the nice things that this large J limit uh, gave us is that it somehow produces uh, this one plus one dimensional structure for us. So when we take this um, a more complicated operator like trace C to the J, uh, what happens is that we have many, many lines going between the top and the bottom, which are the contractions of all these fields. Um, all this should be written with a double line notation. If you want as an exercise, you can do the double line no notation for this simple tree contraction. Um, and, and then we should consider interactions. Um, now interactions, um, well in this case interactions won't change the final answer, but we could still consider the diagrams. Now there's something very important about these diagrams, is that they are restricted to be planar. Okay? So these diagrams are going to connect, um, so the simplest diagrams are going to connect two neighboring lines. I cannot draw, a, for example, a, a photon propagator between, a gluon propagator between two lines that are far from each other, okay? So at one loop, uh, that is if I only restrict, if we only restrict to power g squared, we are only going to consider uh, situations where we have interactions between two neighboring lines, okay? So in the perturbative expansion, uh, the theory on uh, this set of lines uh, is going to be uh, local. So there will be only local interactions. So this large A limit is uh, giving us uh, this bunch of Cs, which uh, are giving you a kind of web uh, on which other particles will propagate. It's producing uh, the space of the one plus one dimensional field theory uh, whose excitations we're going to discuss, okay? Um, very good. So that's, uh, that's a very important uh, idea. Um, and one, then one can, uh, now then we discussed some of the, uh, some of the simplest objects, uh, which are uh, operators uh, which contain a C, they contain uh, some field which is not a C, uh, which is, let's say, W is one uh, complex combination of the other scalar fields. And we can consider uh, situations where uh, this field W is at position L along the chain. So we start 
from some, some end, and then we start uh, labeling the various positions. And here we have a W at position L. Okay? Is it clear what we mean here? Or? This should be very, very clear. If it's not clear, I'll try to repeat it in a different way. No, no questions. Okay. Yes. What was? They are all spin zero fields. They are all scalar fields. So C was a complex field, was a combination of two of the scalar fields of Young Mills theory. Uh, C was equal to five, let's say five plus I five six. And in here, W would be something like phi, uh, let's say one plus I phi two. Okay? It carries charge under an SO2 inside SO6, and this also carries um, charge under an SO2. And this particular SO2, so the J56, is what I'm calling J. So if this, is, this has eigenvalue eigen one under J. Okay. Good. Now, Now we can consider uh, these operators which contain a W sitting at some position, but this will not be eigenstates of the dilatation operator um, because um, if we have, let's say, imagine now we have the same diagram that I was drawing before, before but at some point we have this W, right? So this is the free, uh, free case. And now when we consider interactions, well, there will be uh, various Feynman diagrams you can write down. Uh, so interactions correspond to, for example, exchanging a photon, a gluon between these two fields. Um, um, we could uh, consider a self-energy correction to one of these fields. All those uh, will not change the position, but there is one particular interaction uh, that will change the position, and uh, this comes from a term in the potential uh, that has the form CW um, C bar W, okay? Is it clear to people why we have this uh, term in the potential? So recall that um, the superpotential for the theory um, had a term that, so if we call this third term T, so it had a term T C W, right? These are the three fields. It had a form like this, where these are three complex fields. So this is the superpotential of the theory. Um, and when we calculate the potential, taking the derivative with respect to t and squaring that, we get uh, this term, okay? So that's a term we have in the potential of this theory. And if, so this term leads to uh, Feynman diagrams where, um, where this dotted line can change positions from this side, so we can have the interaction here, and then go all the way here, okay? And so this will uh, give an operator mixing between an operator where the W was sitting at position L and a mixing to the operator where the W is sitting at position uh, L minus one. Okay, is that clear? More or less clear? Now, let me, let me be a little more concrete here. Let, let's uh, just do a little exercise. So how does this diagram lead to the anomalous dimensions? Okay, this is a very simple uh, this is a small side remark. I'm uh, just trying to explain how one does these computations very clearly. Um, so here, we are supposed to insert uh, this term in the Lagrangian. Uh, well, this, this term in Lagrangian, we insert it. We integrate d for x um, over, so where x is the position of the, this insertion point in, uh, in space-time. We have an operator, let's say, at, um, at x1 and another operator at x2. And then we consider um, this propagator and this propagator, so that will give us uh, one over x minus x1 square from one propagator, and we get uh, another square from the fact that there are two, two propagators. So in the end of the day, uh, we get this to the fourth power. So let me just write directly the fourth power here. And there is a similar term uh, with x minus x2, okay? So this is the correction uh, to the two-point function, and uh, you can easily see that this integral will uh, be infinite, okay? So there is an infinity coming from the, the region of integration near x1 and near x2, okay? 
So this integral has a log. So it has a log of, uh, well, let's say, um, some x log of the UV cutoff, let's say lambda, um, times some infrared cutoff, well, let's say it's the distance between these two particles, x1 minus x2. OK, so it has a logarithmic diversions. Now, didn't we say that 10 equal to 4 super young males was finite? Maybe you've heard it's finite. It's no beta function. So what happened? There's something wrong. We got the log. OK. So what's the interpretation of this log? What? No. It's a UV divergence. So it's, a, it's diverging when x is very close to x equal to 1. We have a UV divergence in a theory that was supposed to be finite. Well, I, I'm kind of trying to confuse you, sorry. <laughs> so this log is not cured by renormalization of the coupling. Okay? It's cured by what? What? Good, good, yeah. So, yeah, it's not cured by fermions. This is the only diagram. Uh, well, there, there are many diagrams, but this is the only one that does give this mixing. So it's not cured by fermions. So it's cured by uh, renormalization of the operator. So the operator, which initially in the Bayer theory was just a trace of a bunch of Cs and this W, will now get um, some uh, correction in front uh, that um, will depend on lambda. Okay? And if we were to sum all these logs, so these logs, so when we go to two loops, we'll get log squared, we go three loops, we get log to the fourth, and so on. And all this is going to sum up to some nice little power of uh, lambda times x to some power that depends on g square n, OK? That, that will be the one loop resummation of the logs, and then there's the two loop, and so on, as usual, by, given by the RG uh, equation. OK, good. So, and this is, in practice, how we compute these anomalous dimensions, OK? So in this case, uh, as you probably learned, the anomalous dimensions are a matrix. It's mixing an operator which has uh, a W in position L with an operator which has a W in position L. Uh, plus one, and you really should diagonalize this matrix. Okay, so um, I think the first one to diagonalize this type of matrices was uh, probably Newton, um, when he considered the perturbations moving along a chain of, uh, a chain, I mean, he had these atoms uh, joined by springs and so on, and he considered, so how do you do that? How do we diagonalize this? Well, we use the symmetries, right? What fancy symmetry do we need to diagonalize, diagonalize it in this case? What? Translations, yeah, very good. We use translations. Um, so translations along the chain, OK? So we're going to consider these operators uh, that we were discussing the other day. So we have C. And they're all Cs except for W, which is at position L, OK? So we have a big chain. I'm not drawing the ends of the chain. I'm drawing sort of the middle. Um, so is, is it clear to people what, what I'm meaning by this notation? Is it clear to you? Yes? OK. Th th this should be obvious, I mean, that, that what this means. Is it not obvious? Well, I could explain it better if it's not clear. Um, OK, and now uh, we are supposed to uh, compute this anomalous dimension. And you see here we computed this diagram. And that diagram gave us a mixing between this operator dimension L and dimension L plus 1. And so if we act, if we consider this diagram, so we have a contribution where this field has moved one unit. But since we are summing over all positions, we get a term which is very, we get an operator which is of form very similar to the one we consider, except that there is a shift here. In, in, in P. So the diagram we consider here uh, will give a contribution which will go like e to the i up to this overall side, e to the i plus or minus P. In fact, there will be a term like this and another term that goes like e to the minus i P. OK? So that's uh, from these diagrams where the W gets exchanged, which comes only from this vertex and no from any other vertex. There is no other vertex in, or no other contribution in the n equal to 4 super Yamil's Lagrangian that can give us. Uh, contribution where the position of W changes, 
Okay. Now we need to compute all the other diagrams. So there are all the other diagrams where we have self-energy corrections and all that, where uh, the position of W does not change. Okay. Okay. So how are we going to compute all those other diagrams? Um, well, the good news is that we don't have to compute them, because if we had a situation where P was exactly zero, then this operator um, is BPS. Okay. And it's BPS because, uh, well, one simple way to see it's BPS is, and that this dimension is not protected, is not changed, is that um, you can start with an operator like this and act with the global symmetry generator at tensor C into W, and that gives you, uh, that can turn any of the Cs to a W, so it gives you uh, this operator with P equal to zero. Is that clear? Is it clear why it gives you that? Yes? Okay, so. Um, now, if we evaluate this at p equal to 0, we don't get 0. We get something non-zero. And so we should really subtract here a 2. Okay. And all of this is multiplied by some, uh, by some powers of g and lambda, uh, g and n. And of course, uh, it's power of g squared, because this vertex has a g squared in front. And, uh, and then there is the n from, uh, we are doing planar diagrams, so if we if do the n counting, you'll see that uh, there is a power of n, as we expect. And so, well, that's the final answer for the anomalous dimension of this operator. And there is some number here in front, okay, that you can compute. So let's say this number turns out to be 1. It's not actually 1, but let's see. Okay, so here we got this uh, g square n times uh, sine square p over 2, okay? Now, uh, we were defining this energy, which was the anomalous dimension minus j. So it's the energy above this uh, ground state of uh, many Cs. And for this excitation, we have that E is 1 plus um, lambda. Let me, this is what uh, we were calling lambda before. So lambda times, um, times sine square p over 2. So that's the first correction. And then we'll have a series of corrections um, of higher powers in lambda, right? Lambda squared, blah, 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 OK? Um, but already at this level, we start, seeing, uh, we start seeing a particle that is moving in a system that looks one plus one dimensional. There's time direction, and then there is this space direction. Now notice uh, that. These operators have this uh, periodicity symmetry, p equal to p plus 2 pi. Okay. Now, whenever you have a momentum that is periodic, what is this a signature of? No. So states labeled by momentum p and labeled by momentum p plus 2 pi are the same. So, so it's clear we are particle physicists and we are not condensed matter physicists. Because condensed, condensed matter physicists always have momenta which are like this. This is a signature of a lattice, of a discretized space. Um, and this is what we have here. I mean, we have fixed positions, right? L is an integer. We have fixed positions where the W could live. So we're getting this uh, theory, one plus one dimensional theory, but it seems to be discrete, OK? That's very surprising from the string theory point of view. From the string theory point of view, we, we didn't expect a discrete world shape. We expected a continuous world shape. But that's fine. That's fine. We, don't, we shouldn't despair. Not despair. Uh, there is nothing wrong. Uh, P will not have, in string theory, does not have the interpretation of actually the momentum, but it will have the interpretation of uh, a certain angle that uh, has to be between 0 and 2 pi. But anyway, let's not uh, jump ahead and go to string theory, but let's continue to think of this uh, from the weak coupling point of view. So at zero coupling, we have an infinite degeneracy because this W could be anywhere. And this degeneracy is broken at a non-zero coupling. And we have now a non-trivial dispersion relation. We have this particle. Depending on its momentum, we'll have different energies. Okay? It gets its kinetic term thanks to the interactions in the theory. Okay? So it's, if you wish, it's like a particle which is infinitely massive in the free theory and gets a, uh, a non-zero mass in the, um, in the interacting theory and can start moving along the chain. Okay? Notice for small p, this goes like p squared. Lambda p squared, so lambda is 1 over the mass. Okay. 
And of course, this dispersion relation as any, in any system where we have, um, where, where we have, um, we have periodic, uh, well, we have a, an in intrinsic lattice. It will have some periodicity. We have period 2 pi. Now, as you go to higher orders in lambda, do, do you expect this periodicity to be broken or not? Or do you expect the function, whatever it is, to continue to have the periodicity? What? Periodic. periodic. Somebody said it will be periodic? Well, what, what is the fundamental reason? So well, there will be lots of interactions, but what's the fundamental reason it's periodic, right? Is that we have this discrete number of Cs, right? So, yeah. So it, we expect it to continue to be periodic. It, it should continue to be periodic. Now, one uh, more little thing, so. Yes, yes. Good. Now, in order to organize this calculation, it's uh, useful to think we are at uh, weak coupling. And when we um, recall what you learned in quantum field theory, that um, this operator mixing occurs among operators which have the same global quantum, I mean, the same global charges and the same initial uh, dimension. Okay? And so, and the same initial dimension at weak coupling. So all the operators that we are considering that will mix are operators of, the f of this form, which have, uh, let's say, one W, and that can just move around. That's, those are all the operators that could mix with each other. Let me say it in a different way. Um, operators which have two Ws or psi's and so on, well, first of all, they have higher charges, but they also have higher dimensions. So we're integrating out all these uh, fields. We're considering a lower energy theory where uh, we have charge J equal to, well, um, well, the J corresponding to all these Cs, and then we have an, some additional charge due to this W. Um, these operators uh, in the free theory are all the operators that have lowest possible energy with that charge, okay? All other states have one more unit of, of energy, okay? So they are separated by an order one amount from all the other states in the yam theory, right? There is an infinite degeneracy. So this infinite degeneracy will be broken by the interactions. And that's what we are computing, right? So it's, yes. Yeah, we're looking for the purposes of computing this dispersion relation. We are looking at operators which have j five six, which is very large, right? And j, let's say one two, which is one, right? And have the minimum energy for this dimension, the minimum energy, let's say, in the free theory. That's an infinite number of operators because the W could be in any position, okay? Or a very large number of operators. And now we are trying to break this degeneracy. And the interactions will break the degeneracy, will lift the degeneracy, but will not mix these operators with all other ones, right? Can we not have operators with which have the same quantum No, no, yeah, you, you can check that. So um, fermions don't have, uh, well, first of all, we have delta minus J is equal to one, right? And we, this, well, I'm not sure if I mentioned last time that um, all other states have delta minus J, which is one, two, three, et cetera. Um, and so the fermions with delta minus J is equal to one is just a single fermion. But the single fermion has eigenvalues which are a half under this, not one. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So really these are all the operators we have and we are just breaking the degeneracy and uh, and that's what we are doing. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I had here, I, well, l let me discuss the full set of uh, excitations that have delta equal to one, delta minus J equal to one in this theory. Now, uh, these different excitations, we have different global charges and their various uh, groups. So we can act uh, with any of the JIs which are in SO6, but are broken uh, by uh, the choice of vacuum, so there are four of these guys. So there are four JIs, um, and so there are this W, it's conjugate, and then we could consider the field we call T there, and it's conjugate. So there are four of those guys, so we have four bosons. So this corresponds to inserting on the chain each of these uh, four.
four fields. I goes from one to four. Then uh, we also have uh, the derivatives, the mu. So this, these are the derivatives in the space-time directions. Recall uh, we have these operators, which are sitting here at the origin. And well, we could choose this to be the origin, and its descendants are given by acting with derivatives. And so in other words, here we could have a bunch of Cs and a derivative mu of C and a bunch of Cs. Okay? And there are four of these. Um, and of course, they transform under different uh, groups. One is the SO4 of spatial rotations. The other one is the SO4 inside the SO6 of uh, internal rotations. Okay? Uh, and finally, we uh, have eight things that we get by acting with SUSI. Um, some eight Qs. There are more Qs, but these are the eight Qs that um, lead to insertions of Psi. Now, Psi has dimension three halves, and we are interested in things that have delta minus J equal to one. So these are the Psi's that, under J, have J equal to a half. So there are 16 Psi's, but there are only eight that have J equal to a half. Okay? So we have uh, four boson eight bosonic excitations and eight fermionic excitations that can move along this chain. It's good we had the same number of bosons and fermions since we, this vacuum preserves some supersymmetries, and whatever they are, they should be representation of the, um, of the supersymmetries that are preserved by Cs. Okay. Now, okay, so these are different excitations, and it's uh, very important to understand the symmetries of this problem as we are exploiting all, always the symmetries. And as I mentioned, I mentioned, but I will repeat now again. So when we consider this type of operator, when we consider this operator, we are breaking the initial full supergroup, which has some name, SU2, 2, 2, slash 4. This is the or initial full supergroup. It's breaking it into uh, an SU2 slash 2 square supergroup. Now, what is SU2 slash 2? Well, I mentioned uh, a bit last time. Uh, it's a supergroup that contains uh, some Qs that have indices under the two SU2s, some Ss that have indices under the two SU2s. Uh, alpha and beta dot are transformed under um, the two bosonic subgroups of SU2. So this, the bosonic part, consists of two SU2s times uh, U1. That uh, is really not a U1, but we call it R. Uh, it's the identity matrix inside this super matrix. We had a super matrix of bosonic, uh, bosonic, and uh, Qs and Ss. And uh, it should be identified in the cu current uh, discussion with what we are calling E in this discussion. OK? It's SU2. Ah, uh, yeah, I didn't mention one important thing is that when this S means super trace. So for super groups, S means uh, super trace. So the identity matrix here is. Um, it has determinant, well, has trace zero, super trace zero, right? So it's really SU2. Uh, but you're, 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 you will see that it's actually not even this, this group. So we'll, there's an important uh, new thing that we, we are going to get to. Um, very good. Um, now, whenever you have a group, so you have a super group. What, what, what is something? You always look at when we, you have supersymmetry and so on. What's perhaps one of the most important things about supersymmetry? When you have a particle and in a supersymmetric theory, what's the first thing you ask? What, what representation of supersymmetry it is in? And what's, is it in a long representation? Is it in a short representation, right? By now, this should be like the first thing you ask you. So you, would, you, you have supersymmetric theory, you get this particle, is it in a long, short representation? What is it? This is, uh, this is a trick that's been used over and over again uh, throughout the school. Witten used it a lot, and uh, everyone here used it a lot. So, and we are going to use it here. It will be crucial for what I'm going to say now. Um, Okay, so by now you're probably experts in counting the dimensions of long representations. And let me remind you what, uh, or let me state what the, so the Qs and the, Qs and the Ss have 
in the right, this comes from QCs and S's of uh, the original n equal to four theory. And so here we have dilatation operators and currents, which in our context will be uh, the, this energy plus the two SU2, uh, these are the two SU2 generators. I'm not writing all the indices. But okay, so now we consider some representation which has energy much bigger than these SU2 charges. Let's say that um, uh, it's a generic representation. And uh, what will be its dimension? Well, we need to, we think of these guys. So you remember the method? So Ed went through this in great detail. So we have creation and relation operators. Uh, we have two, two, and what number do we have? So we have, the Qs have two indices under each SU2, so we have four of them. So we have two to the fourth equal to 16 states, okay? Very good. So that's the dimension of the representation of each SU2 slash two. So if we had two copies, we would have 16 times 16, right? Now, what do we have? We have uh, eight of each, right? And so it, Certainly, it's not in a long representation, right? Um, okay. So, in fact, uh, when E is similar to one of these charges, uh, you will have shortening of the representations, as usual. And for those representations, E cannot be a random number, but it has to be related to the, the charges. And the shortest representation or fundamental representation of SU2 slash two is a representation that contains two bosons and two fermions. And under the two SU2s, this is the bosonic uh, content. So the two bosons transform under um, the, let's say, second SU2 and the two fermions transform under the first SU2, okay? <coughs> For this purpose, that, so one transforms under one SU2 and the other under the, the other SU2. So in total, we have four. So we have four states, and now it's, we are, we are in, we, it's good because we have four states for one SU2 slash two and four states for the other SU2 slash two. So we have 16 states in total, and that's what we, uh, what we had, okay? Um, so again, uh, so under each SU2 slash two, we had two SU2 slash twos, and uh, one transforms in the so-called fundamental representation, sometimes denoted this way, um, and the other in the fundamental, uh, well, sorry, and the, the, partic the total particles transform in the product of the two representations, right? Sorry, it's only one line. Uh, it's consistent notation. Um, very good. So, and we said that when we have BPS representations, their energies cannot change. So if you change the coupling a little bit, its energy cannot change, right? That's something we learned. Now we come back and we look at this energy. So we have one, which was good. This was the BPS value of the energy. And we have plus lambda P squared, okay? Now this should shake your confidence in the laws of physics at least uh, arguments based on supersymmetry. Does this mean the arguments based on supersymmetry are wrong? There's something wrong. I, I said something that was wrong. Something is wrong, in, uh, so find the error. That's one possibility, so let's see. Maybe the state with non-zero P is not BPS. Could that be possible? How many states does a non-BPS representation have? Recall it had twice, four times the number of states. But when we gave this particle some momentum, we didn't change the number of states, still eight states. I mean, eight, eight plus eight, so 16 states in total. So no, that's not what we did wrong. So this. Different short, but we had only one. We had only one short representation. This figure in Ned's talk, hint, was something that figured was important in Witten's talk. Good, good, wonderful. 
we forgot something. This, this algebra is wrong, okay? The algebra is wrong. We needed uh, some central charges. Okay, so the initial algebra, so the algebra of SU2 slash 2 had Q with Qs equal to 0, as well as S with S is equal to 0, right? And the central charges will appear here in the right-hand side as uh, some kappa and some kappa bar, so this, uh, they will contribute to each other. And well, the indices, uh, this will be a singlet under the two SU2s, okay? So that's what we did wrong. So we need to include some central charges, okay? Now let's, do, let's try to understand why the central charges are present. So what happens if we uh, have a bunch of Cs, we have a W, and we act with a Q. So we, add, we take this, uh, this operator, and we act one time with a Q. Well, we'll transform this W into some kind of fermion. Now what happens if we add with a Q again? So what happens if we, add, if we act with supersymmetry in a fermion? What do we get? What? Well, a boson, but uh, derivative of a boson, yes. Um, but in, in theories with superpotential, do you remember there was some term, extra term we got? So we get F terms, right? And the F term is equal to the derivative of that superpotential, so it's CW. So we'll get here a CW, okay? So wherever we had the fermion, we'll get a C, time, a C commutator W, okay? Now notice the dimension here increased by one half, the dimension here increased by another one half. So from W, we went to W and a C, okay? So we get, so we get something that looks similar uh, to the original state, except that contains this extra C. Now imagine this guy was at position L, and we were acting on this on uh, particles of momentum, of fixed momentum of, of um, we were acting with particles uh, which have some definite momentum. Um, so then, uh, when we get this new C, well, if the C is afterwards, well, we don't care so much, right? So the W was at the same position of C and the chain is infinite, let's say, at least at first sight, we don't care too much about this extra C. But if the C is before the W, then we need to rearrange so that uh, we, uh, get something that, um, so that now the W is not at position L, but it's at position L plus one, right? And in order for it to look at the same as the initial operator, we need to shift by one unit, and that produces an extra factor of E to the IP, right? So what we get is something, we get one from the situation where, let's say, the W or minus one when the C, when the C is after the W, and something like E to the minus IP, because we'll need to, uh, reshuffle the, the summation index. Okay, is that clear? And then it's going to, at one loop it will be just proportional to G. Um, so that's uh, the type of central charge we get. So here, well, I haven't shown, shown it explicitly, so I only shown you that if you are twice, you get this, but if you consider the anti-commutator of these two Qs, you, you'll get some non-trivial uh, term here. So we got this. So that's uh, the central charge. So in principle, the full algebra has these two operators, and for a state of momentum p, the central charge has some particular value, so it's some particular function of p, which uh, we have derived here, okay? Now, when you have the central charge, the uh, BPS condition is uh, changed, and now, uh, well, one can do the exercise. There is one trick to do it easily. Uh, it's going to be one plus uh, kappa kappa bar, where K and K bar, or kappa and kappa bar, are the right-hand sides there of the uh, central charges. And in our case, we said that this was going to be one plus, uh, well, something proportional to lambda, and then here, sine square of P over two, okay? E square, this is E square, sorry. Good. Now, this is the, the formula for the dispersion relation, and this is the derivation of the formula for the dispersion relation. Now, the way I said it, uh, this looks like uh, it's a one-loop derivation, but in fact, you can prove uh, that 
um, the central charge K has to have this precise K dependence, this is, sorry, this precise P dependence, the precise momentum dependence at all loops. And this is for consistency and it's in one of the exercises. Um, now, uh, let's see. Well, may maybe if I have time, I'll try to explain why, the, this is, why that is the case. Um, but, um, so you can show that at low loops, it's given by uh, this particular function of P. Uh, now, the function of lambda, in principle, uh, could be different. So here we could get some other function of lambda. Uh, but it's observed that for n equal to 4 superior mills, this function of lambda um, remains lambda. Right? It's not changed, at least to the extent that calculations have been done. Now, all the formulas that are used, that are, will be derived from here, they all depend on whatever function is appearing here. So we'll define our lambda in the next formulas to be whatever, it, whatever uh, this function is. Now, these arguments, okay, so one question is the following. Have we used integrability up to now? Did we use integrability or any fancy symmetry up to now? What did we use? So we, we had these operators. We used uh, translation symmetry, not very fancy symmetry. Um, we used supersymmetry. Well, this is uh, somewhat fancy, but no, not too, I mean, it's common. You've seen it before. Um, and that's it. And this argument also didn't rely on any fancy symmetry. Um, and the fact that this, is a, this function of P also doesn't rely on any fancy symmetry. So this has been derived under general principles. It's valid in any theory that has these symmetries. Now, there are theories that have these symmetries that are not integrable, that, that have exactly the same structure and are not integrable, but they will continue to have this dispersion relation fixed by supersymmetry. OK? We used? Yeah. We used? Yes, th yeah. That, yeah. Yes, yes. So, well. You see, yeah. Mm. Yes, I guess in all cases where uh, you get at least at one loop a non-zero answer, you have to have something similar, some effect, that superpotential or something similar that will give you the, at least one loop. But once you get the one loop, you get the all orders. I mean, if you didn't have anything like the superpotential, then it would be just flat one. It wouldn't have any correction. But in, in any theory that is self-respected, I don't know, you can, you will have some correction. Uh, e square one plus kk bar. Yeah, this is the for, this is the BPS mass formula that follows from the supersymmetry algebra with these central charges. Right. Now I have I haven't derived this for you, so I just stated the final answer. Um, well, let me see. Um, well, maybe we'll derive it in the. In the question answer. I'll tell you how to derive it. Um, it's in the exercises anyway. Um, OK, so that can be derived by elementary methods. We uh, didn't use any uh, special symmetry. And in going, what I'm going to so say now, we also will not use any uh, integrability property of the theory. So the first task is uh, the dispersion relation. And this is an all order result. So we, will, we managed to derive this result, which is an exact result in this theory. Um, now, uh, we, so we, we comp this is the complete solution of the one particle problem. So we have one particle. It can have some momentum and some energy. And we computed the energy as a function of the momentum. That's it. So the one particle problem is completely Solved. Now, two particles. OK. So now we have this chain. And now we can have um, two particles. Now, when they're very far away from each other, um, and these two particles could be a fermion and a psi, let's say. Uh, a psi and a, and a w. So when they are very far, each one is moving happily with its own momentum, p1, and let's say p2, or I can put p2 in the other direction. So p1 and p2. 
And when they, close, they come close together, they'll interact in some way. Um, and then they uh, will fly apart and uh, some, something will result from this. Uh, and let's say the final state is, uh, it, again, a two-particle state. Here we'll assume uh, we'll have some other state. Um, so this, uh, well, in this particular case, I think uh, they cannot. We'll have some psi and let's say some w. In principle, they could have changed identities. Uh, um, so we have the one with p2. We could have had the psi going this way also. Um, so there's some scattering. So we had two initial particles with momentum p1 and p2. And we are considering just the two particle scattering that goes to momentum p1 and p2. Just energy and momentum conservation, at least generically, imply that the momenta of the initial and final particles are going to be the same. So that's the problem we'd like to analyze. Um, and in general, um, this uh, two particle amplitude is uh, some matrix which depends on the indices of the initial and final particles. Um, so let's say, let's call them A and B. So the initial, the initial particles could have some indices A1 and A2. I mean, these indices run over uh, these 16 values, so the four, four bosons and four fermions. Oh, actually, sorry, I made a small mistake. So in order to analyze the S matrix, yeah, oh, well, no, no mistake. So this, this matrix will factorize into two matrices um, where the indices only range over um, these four values, right? Um, because the initial particle was a product of two representations, so each of the indices will scatter in its own way. Um, and the group theory, I mean, this is just the group theory simply implies that the S matrix will be a product of the two S matrices. So again, uh, let me call it uh, B1, B2, A1, and A2, and similarly for the other indices. And, and from now on, we'll discuss one of these at a time. So we'll try to understand what uh, SU2 slash 2 extended. So um, SU2 slash 2 extended means we have the original SU2 slash 2 algebra extended by these central charges. And we'll try to understand what this implies uh, for this S matrix. Yes. Yes. Why do we consider Well, because the, the, the indices are conserved on their own, right? So uh, there is, uh, yeah. Um, well, when you have a product of, uh, okay, yeah, to, to argue completely it's factorized, I need one more little thing. I mean, it could be a sum of factors like this, okay? It could also be a sum of factors. There is one reason why it's not a sum of factors that I'm going to get into, and let me answer the question later. So the reason it's not a sum of factor is that factors is that there is uh, here a unique S matrix for this guy. Um, and the reason, there, the reason there is a unique uh, S matrix, or that th this matrix is completely determined up to an overall phase. Of course, the overall phase or the overall factor is, is arbitrary, but the group theory determines all the index structure of this guy. OK? And why is that? Well, let's think about this uh, scattering process as occurring in time. So we have some particle P1 and P2. It's forming some intermediate state uh, that uh, will transform in some representation of SU2 slash 2. So that's the same as saying that we take these two indices and we take uh, a representation which is a direct product of the, these two representations we'll get some SU2 slash 2 extended representation. What, what do you think? Will it be short representation or long representation? Let's calculate the dimension, so. Well, let, let's see. Does the energy here have any special relationship to the momentum or to the charges, or it could be anything? I mean, we could have something with momentum P a minus P, right? So this energy could be anything in principle. Therefore, um, we expect it in general to be a long representation, right? Now let's just check that, just uh, for sanity, checks that, check that this is reasonable. 
So we have four states here, and another four states here, and so we have 16 states in total. Okay? And that was the dimension of the long representation of a single SU2 slash 2. Okay, so here we have the 16 states, a long representation, single long representation, and uh, the out state is just corresponds to decomposing it again in terms of the states with momentum P1 and P2. Okay, so this, yeah, this argument should convince you that uh, this S matrix is completely determined. I mean, all we have to do is take the initial state, decompose it in terms of this uh, 16 states, and then re-decompose it again back into two other representations, and that's it. So that, uh, there is a single state, intermediate state, so there should be a single, um, single factor. Good. Since there is a single factor for this, therefore the S matrix has to have this product. It couldn't be a sum of, of terms. Um, okay, so, now I'm, and again here we haven't used integrability yet. So this is just a property of group theory. Now, it's important here to consider this SU2 slash 2 extended, and it's important to use a certain subtlety that I haven't discussed. Uh, maybe I'll discuss it later if you want. But at least conceptually, let me ignore that subtlety, but uh, conceptually, uh, I mean, that subtlety has to do with the following. So naively here, we decompose into P1 and P2, and if we re-decompose again, we just get the same P1 and P2, so the S matrix would just be 1. Right? Now, the reason it's not 1 is due to some, um, some small... Uh, issue, which is the way how this k uh, really acts. So when we introduce this extra c here, we are shifting the, the, moment, the positions of all the other particles that could be to the right, and that introduces other factors of e to the ip, and due to these factors, this S matrix is actually non-trivial. Um, but anyway, it, it's a finite uh, algebraic uh, exercise to uh, compute this S matrix, and I, and in the end you do it and you find, uh, you find that this matrix. So in principle it's a 16 by 16 matrix and you compute all its components. Of course you don't have to ha compute so many things because there are many uh, global symmetries like all these SU2s and so on. So in the end you have to find 10 functions. You find those 10 functions and you are done. You computed the matrix structure of the S matrix. And no integrability has been used so far. Um, so all this is valid even in non-integrable theories. So final S matrix is some factor we were going to call S0 that depends on momenta 1 and 2. So by 1 and 2 I mean P1 and P2. Well, maybe I should just write P1 and P2 times some uh, S of the first SU2 uh, slash 2 times some S hat of the second one. And these are completely expi explicit matrices by now. So completely f explicit functions of the momenta and so on. Um, okay, but now it looks like we still need to fix one function. So we all we gain is going from uh, 16 times 16 functions to just uh, uh, one function. But we still have to compute one function uh, which will be a function of the coupling. Right? Um, but now, uh, now is that where integrability comes in. Integrability will come in in helping us to uh, determine this one function. So how has this function been fixed? Well, first, uh, one needs to understand its uh, properties. Well, first, it has to be a periodic function of pi. So pi should be, if you go to pi plus 2 pi, should uh, continue to be the same. Uh, it has to be unitary, so 1, 2, S2, 1 should be 1. Um, and we need to assume something about its analytic structure, and well, there you really have to guess. Um, but one thing that we are going to assume that, uh, that is very important uh, for fixing it is we are going to assume uh, that we still have crossing symmetry. Now, if you recall, uh, crossing symmetry in relativistic theories is due to the fact that uh, the dispersion relation um, has two solutions for, the, for each energy. So for each momentum, you have the solution with energy, positive energy and with negative energy. Okay? And the, 
what happens is that if you start with some momentum and you start analytically continuing in the momentum, you can continuously go to the solution that has negative energy. There is no way to say well, you keep on. Once you start, once you give yourself the freedom of doing analytic continuations, you will encounter the solution with negative energy. And you have to ask, well, how am I going to interpret this solution? What does it mean? And one thing you, one thing you could say is, well, maybe it's the same as in relativistic theories. Uh, and we are going to impose re, um, crossing symmetry, even though the theory is not relativistic. So what's crucial is the two signs for the, um, for the energy, not so much the precise function of the momentum. OK, so um, we need crossing. And now crossing symmetry, recall that if you have uh, an amplitude of two particles, let's say, of positive charges, um, that are uh, going this way and scattering into two particles also with positive charges. This by crossing, so by changing E1 to minus E1 and P1 to minus P1. This is not just a substitution in the amplitude, but it's an analytic continuation of the amplitude right, to the cross channel. Um, we will get the amplitude minus plus going to minus plus. Okay? So crossing relates uh, this particular amplitude with this one, with the minus signs. So particles with positive charge with particles with negative charge. Sometimes we say particles and antiparticles. The cross of a particle is an antiparticle. Right? That's the usual statement. OK. Um, so crossing will relate S0 at 1 and 2 to S0 at uh, one, my, one bar means the cross particle of one, so we change E and P following some analytic continuation path that has to, in principle, be specified. And this is going to be related to the ratio of these amplitudes. But the ratio of these amplitudes, uh, we know from the calculation of that S matrix. Okay, so if the, the matrix structure of the S matrix allows us to calculate the ratio of these amplitudes, and this will be a, spe a specific function of the momenta, one and two. I'm not giving you all the details, but just explaining the basic idea. And this is a known function, and this S0 is an unknown function, which in principle we have to fix. And um, now you have to, at this point, these are all the equations, and now you have to guess. And you might guess right, you might guess wrong. There, it was guess wrong first. Um, and the wrong guesses didn't obey properties we wanted, like, for example, reproducing the um, reproducing, the, uh, reproducing the strong coupling expansion or, or other problems of that type or reproducing the fall loop um, or reproducing various other things. Um, but now there is a guess that uh, we all like. We think everyone working, well, almost, I think almost everyone working in this field thinks it's correct. And, um, that guess is explicit function of, uh, of P1 and P2. It's not uh, terribly complicated. It's, uh, I mean, you can write it in one line after introducing some notation. It's basically uh, some gamma function, some integral of some gamma functions. I could write it down a little more explicitly if you wanted. But it's a, a more or less explicit function. Now, I, sh I should mention that uh, this is really an experimental subject. So you really try something. It, works, it might not work, uh, you have to throw it away, you have to have your waste, uh, pa waste paper basket uh, nearby, and you should be ready to throw it many ideas out before you find one that works. But um, the one that was found works and it passes various consistency checks, so it has singularities at various locations that have correct, uh, where you expect to find singularities and so on. Okay, so uh, the bottom line here is that um, this problem when j is equal to infinity, is completely solved. It's completely solved because once we found the two particle S matrix, now due to integrability, we can find any n particle S matrix. So we have n particles going to n particles, we can do that. And, okay, so let me, uh, make a short little summary of what the method was to solve this. So first, we took the large A limit. We considered the basic excitations. We understood the, how they transform under the symmetries. We understood 
some subtleties uh, related to the symmetries, but once we understood those subtleties, we understood these are BPS particles, um, and then we understood the matrix form of their scattering, so we understood how the group indices uh, change when you do the scattering process. And finally, and that was one of the most difficult parts, was to find uh, this S0, finding actually uh, this phase factor. Um, okay, but now uh, we already know this, this answer. Um, and in the, in the problems, I, I've written a couple of references which uh, describe uh, this derivation and describe uh, some properties of the phase factor. Um, okay, so now uh, we go to finite J. Are there any questions up to now? Uh, a list of what has been done and so on. No? Okay. So first, um, consider a J which is finite but very large. Okay. J finite, finite, but large. Now, wh why do we need J to be large? We, we need J to be large because this S matrix that we found is what's normally called an asymptotic S matrix. What it means is that once you start considering interactions, right? I mean, they're all kind, these particles somehow, somehow get dressed, gets dressed with a, with a cloud of gluons around and so on, right? And so in order to really measure this S matrix, you really need to wait, you need to send in the two particles and then wait for a long time until they are very well separated and only then you can be sure that uh, this S matrix is, uh, I mean, that, that what the amplitude you measure is the actual asymptotic form of the S matrix. While, while these two things are not separated, so imagine you have the two Ws, they've just scattered and they are still separating. The wave function will not yet have stabilized in its asymptotic form, okay? Yes? Uh, do you use the alias dual somewhere in guessing the... Yes, yes, yes. I didn't, I didn't mention it, but... Well, I mentioned it. I, I mentioned that some guesses were wrong because they didn't reproduce ADS. And yeah, the, the ADS calculation was uh, pretty important for making the correct guess because... Uh, the correct guess was basically almost equal to the one loop uh, correction to the, so it was equal to the three level and one loop correction at strong coupling, plus some other further corrections. But, uh, but it was mainly, the, its main analytic properties were given by the analytic properties of the strong coupling prediction and its uh, one loop correction. Now, some, some people say that uh, also the idea of crossing symmetry is more natural at, um, at strong coupling, because there you have a, an underlying relativistic theory which should, in principle, have crossing symmetry and a continuous world sheet and so on, where uh, the arguments leading to crossing symmetry would be more, more reasonable. Yeah. So, um, your method that you mentioned, does it work for other case theories and forms? Yes, so the derivation of the S matrix without the phase factor works in other circumstances also. And uh, including the derivation of the phase factor, it has only been uh, done in n equal to four super Young mills and in uh, the, the Young mills chern simons uh, matter theory in three, three dimensions that uh, Daniel Jefferies will discuss. So only in these two cases. It, it has been done completely at, at this level. And there, there are fewer, fewer consistency checks of the case of three dimensions, but there are more consistency checks of this, this particular case, the n equal to four super young mills case. I should mention just in passing that um, in the case of uh, this three-dimensional theory, everything is almost identical, except that instead of having two SU2 at, at, at this stage, well, you start uh, with a very similar story, and uh, instead of SU2 slash two squared, you have SU2 slash two cross U1. So that's the only change. And then you'll have the same matrix form of the S matrix and very similar uh, factor S0. And in fact, the guess is that the factor S0 is the square root of this factor that we were talking about here. Um, yes? Mm -hmm. If you have crossing symmetry. Yes. So 
if you vary continuously the... It's not in the supergravity, it's in the world sheet, on the world sheet of the string. So we have a string that's on the world sheet. We are talking about the two-dimensional theory on the world sheet. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. the, in the world sheet yes, yes. have a, a crossing symmetry. Yes. But, but that's, that corresponds to strongly coupled uh, gauge theory. Yes, yes. So crossing symmetry, I, I mean, this is a proper, when I say solve for the phase factor, I mean solve for all values of the coupling, for weak and strong coupling. You find the solution which at weak coupling uh, goes to, um, well, to whatever you find if you do a one-loop calculation. So at one loop, you can calculate the scattering of these two Ws. It corresponds to calculating the scattering a certain model that the one-loop calculation reduces to something called the Heisenberg spin chain, which was solved by Bethe in the 30s. And he found the S, the S matrix. So this overall phase factor and so on, it reduces to that value at weak coupling. And at strong coupling, it re reproduces what, whatever you calculate if, if you do this at strong coupling. Yes? Um, which constraints on the S matrix uh, fix the lambda dependence of this? Uh, which constraints? So here, here uh, we, the lambda dependence all comes in through this formula, okay? So if uh, someone computes this, first of all, it's generally believed that uh, there is no correction to this formula because it's being checked up to five, four loops at weak coupling. And it was also checked at one and two, uh, well, actually, up to two loops at strong coupling. So it's been checked that this is not changed, okay? Now, if someone comes and does, a, I don't know, seven loops and it changes at seven loops, okay, fine, this function changes, but none of the rest of the formulas change when expressed in, ter in terms of this function. So the whole coupling dependence comes through here. So here there is some lambda. When you compute that, um, when you compute that S hat, that unfortunately is behind the black, <laughs> when you compute S hat, you will find that it depends on lambda uh, because the representations, you know, the central charges depend on lambda. So it's similar to what, for example, in cyber witten theory where the central charges depend on G, right? Uh, so they depend on lambda. So this S hat will depend on lambda. Therefore, that function F12 will depend on lambda, right? Now the crossing operation also depends on lambda because the, pros, the, the idea of doing crossing and so on, well, you need to know, um, you need to know exactly what, you're, what lambda is to, to do crossing. So, and so in the end, the S0 that you have will depend on lambda, right? So that's how lambda comes in. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's a pretty nice story. Um, So first, uh, we need to understand what P is. Um, so it turns out that um, you have the sphere, and you have a great circle on the sphere, right? And when you take very large, well, fir first, what J is. So we start uh, with the operator trace, trace C to the J for very large J. So let's start with supergravity. So in supergravity, we have some modes. J corresponds to angular momentum on the sphere. It corresponds to a, some particular mode of the graviton that moves very fast on the sphere. So it's a particle that is moving very fast on the sphere. Now something that has very large momentum, you can think of it as localized uh, at some point on the sphere, uh, moving very fast. Now I can choose uh, a way to measure in angles so that uh, my time moves together to the angle so that I will freeze this fast motion. I will freeze the very fast motion and I'm going to treat it as being time independent, okay? So very large shape corresponds to a particle that is just sitting here and rotating, but I'm just going to draw it uh, as sitting stationary, okay? Now when you have uh, a chain of C's with some W in the middle, turns out that this corresponds to uh, this particle being split into two things. So the first part is the, the whole left side of the chain maps to this point in space-time. The whole right part of the chain maps to this point in space-time. And the part in the middle is some string that goes between one point and the next, okay? Now, of course, in a, in a closed string configuration, the sum over all the momenta, well, the, actually, e to the i sum over all the momenta should be one. Um, 
Oh, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, the momentum P is just this angle. So it's the angle relative to the center. So I'm going to view the sphere from above, and I'm here going to just draw the equator of the sphere. And um, let's say this was the initial point, and this is, and this is the point to the left, this is the point to the right. And this angle here is the momentum P. Okay? So um, that's uh, what we have. And uh, yeah, what was uh, the central charge? Yes. So it turns out that there are some coordinates uh, where we really actually can think about this uh, plane as a real physical plane. And the central charge is really the length of this vector. And it arises because uh, in supergravity, we, whenever we have, well, in supergravity, when we have the commutator of two supersymmetries, um, so the anti-commutator of two supersymmetries, I'm not sure if Melanie explained this, uh, we have, of course, they commute to, uh, to uh, coordinate transformation, but also the anti-commute to transformations of the B field. So delta lambda, where lambda is uh, transformations of the NSB field, okay? gauge transformations of the NSB field. So that means that whenever you have a stretch string, there will be a contribution to the central charge, uh, some contribution in the right-hand side. And this is precisely what we have. So that's the, inter the interpretation here. And then, yeah, and then the stuff I said about the ordering and so on is related to the fact that if you have momenta, you have to uh, put them one after the other in this particular fashion. And of course, if you have a closed string, uh, this uh, should close, so the momentum should close like this, or you could go, go back and close like that, and so on. Okay? Good. So that's the strong coupling picture for, uh, for this. These are sometimes called magnons. This partic the single particles are sometimes called magnons because, as I said, in the uh, one-loop approximation, uh, it reduces to the Heisenberg spin chain, so a chain of spins, and in that context, uh, that particles were called magnons uh, in the 30s. So the central charge is something right. What? The central charge is the length of, well, the, cent the central charge is a complex number, right? And it's, the, it's this vector, including its orientation. So one complex number appears in K, so K bar is the complex conjugate, okay? And what appears here is the absolute value of this vector. And that's uh, what we get here. Yes? This is the dispersion relation for all values of the coupling. Yeah. Well, maybe I, OK. May I emphasize this a little more? Um, this, originally, we dis discussed first. So first of all, at weak coupling, we derived this without the square. OK? Very important difference. It didn't have the square at weak coupling. OK? This was the leading order correction. All the other corrections come from putting a square here. That's it. OK? It's a factor of two. Um, now, at weak coupling, I said there was an infinite degeneracy of states. And then there was, they were lifted just a little bit by, uh, by their momentum, right? There was a little tiny interaction that lifted the degeneracy. Now, we go to strong coupling. This is huge. This is a huge factor of strong coupling, right? So as soon as we give the, the particle just a little bit of momentum, its energy would be huge. OK? Let me go to some place where I don't need. So let me, let me draw the dispersion relation at weak and strong coupling. So this is p. This is, uh, let's say, 2 pi. Uh, this is, well, let me draw it up to pi. This is pi, and this is zero, okay? So at weak coupling, we start from one, okay? And then we have a very tiny little correction, okay? Goes up a little bit here, then comes back down, okay? So that was at weak coupling. At strong coupling, we get something that starts out from one here again. It looks relativistic for a while. Uh, because for very large p, we can, with for very large coupling, we can expand this in first power. Well, here we get p squared times lambda. So it looks relativistic for a while. And then curves up and uh, looks, looks like this. And this curve is nothing else than e square root of lambda, lambda over pi squared sine of p. 
right? So we just took the square root that is there, we ignore the one, and we get this curve. So if we ignore the one, we get the curve that goes all the way to zero, but for small p it's corrected, okay, and we get that. So that's the strong coupling. Now one, one thing you see from the strong coupling uh, answer is that as soon as p is just a little bit, we get a very large value for the, for the energy, right? So at strong coupling, we really want to have particles which have very, very tiny momentum, okay? Strong coupling doesn't like uh, particles with high momentum. Okay. And that's, that's, why, that's basically the reason why all these operators we discussed in the beginning, all the operators that are not protected, um, which are the ones where the particles have momentum, uh, go to infinity and, and they disappear from the spectrum. So that's the basic, the basic reason. The basic reason is this dispersion relation. Okay, this dispersion relation contains a lot of information. It's, uh, and now, in order to make the statement that the, all, the, par all the, the spectrum really all goes up and so on, you, uh, you need to do a little more than what, we, what we've done, because it might be that uh, for very short chains, these effects of the dispersion relation are not important. They are canceled by some S matrix factor or whatever. So you need to do a little more work to show that. But the basic reason is that uh, it's this, this behavior of the dispersion relation. Um, Okay, um, now, um, am I finishing now, unorganized? Uh, let's see. No organizer is here now. Okay, I guess I'm, oh yeah. <laughs> Technically I'm done, but I could go on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'll be the chairman during your, your talk, Igor, right? <laughs> um. <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. But yes. <laughs> um. <laughs> what, more? more time? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> One hour, right? <laughs> okay, now, I, I just want to say something very, uh, well, only one point, um, a couple of points. So first, uh, how you go to find IJ, okay? Um, if J is sufficiently large and the particles are sufficiently dilute, we can still trust the computation of the asymptotic S matrix for computing the wave function, right? So the wave function of the particles, let's say we have two particles, is, uh, so we have particle W here, particle W here, a bunch of Cs, this at position, the L1, L2, so this will be E to the I, P1, L1, plus P2, L2, right? And this will be the correct wave function when L1 is less than L2. And when L1 is bigger than L2, what, uh, what do you expect? Well, we expect S of uh, P1 and P2 times the same thing, okay? When L1 is bigger than L2, okay? That's just, uh, if you wish, the definition of what this S matrix is. Okay, so you have this wave function of X1 and X2. Let's say for the time being we have two particles, and we want to demand that it is periodic. So we input the fact that J is finite by demanding that, um, that this is periodic under X1. Well, I, I changed notation between L and X here. Let me call it L here again. So the wave function L is uh, whatever is uh, multiplying here. This is psi L1, L2. And the same is, uh, this whole thing is psi L1, two. So, and this should be periodic under uh, L1 goes to L1 plus J and L2, okay? And um, so if you look at this wave function, imagine you, this is L2, we measure the period from here. Uh, so we get zero, then we go all the way around and then we get the factor of the S matrix. So we have something of the form E to the IP1 J times S1, uh, P1, P2 equal to one. So this is the periodicity condition on the wave function. Um, okay, that's for two particles. There's a similar equation for the other particle. And, and in the particular case of n equal to four super young mills, the, the fact that the trace is cyclic implies that uh, e to the i P1 plus P2 should be one. So this is uh, another condition we are imposing. 
So the con this condition will typically quantize, I mean, will make the momenta discrete. So before there were continuous functions, if it was a continuous number between zero and two pi, and now it will be discrete, okay? We'll have some discrete values. I mean, if S was one, then this is just the usual condition that says that P1 would be n two pi, n times two pi over j, okay? That's just the usual uh, periodicity condition. Um, and then, uh, if you have many particles, uh, well, yeah, if you have many particles, you have, uh, you have to repeat this several times. Uh, so each time, so let's say we have here the particle one, which was the one we were considering. Each time this particle crosses another particle, we get a factor of s. So we get the product of many factors of s. So we have e to the i p, let's say, 1, uh, s, p1, and p, l. And here the product over all l different than 1 um, should be equal to 1. Okay? And these are, these are the so-called beta equations, or they are the equations that determine the spectrum for, uh, for a dilute uh, gas of particles. So here we use the fact uh, we derived this when the particles were dilute, and we also assume that when three particles come together, we don't get any further correction, okay? Um, and well, for dilute particles, it's also good enough. Okay, so that's uh, the equation. So in general, we have n of these equations for each of the particles, L different from I. Um, and uh, well, L was probably not a good variable because I used it for the position, so let me call it J. So these are the beta equations that determine the spectrum, the momenta, and then uh, the energy, the total energy, which is the total dimension of the operator minus its spin, um, it's SO6 spin, is given by the sum of E of pi, okay? From I equal to one to N, where these are solutions of these equations. So you typically get a discrete set of solutions, which involves choosing some Ns analogous to these Ns that are appearing here that appear here for a free particle, but in this case, you get something similar. Um, now, in the full problem, we have something similar to this. So here I discussed the, these equations in the case that uh, we have Ws everywhere, which is a particular case. So if we consider the full S matrix, and we consider as initial states two, two of these W states, so it states that have some non-trivial uh, charge, SO6 charge, um, then they cannot scatter into any other state, so we have two W initial states, we'll get two W final states. So there is a closed subsector, so there is a concept of a subsector. Now here we are indeed using integrability, uh, so there is a concept of SU2 subsector, well, subsect, let me call it subsector. Which contains operators of the form trace C to many powers and W to ma many, many Ws. So many Cs and many Ws. This will not mix with other operators for basically the same reason I explained before. And that, that was a reason only at weak coupling. But the same reason uh, continues to hold at all values of the coupling thanks to integrability. So thanks to the fact that the whole S matrix is determined by these two particle S matrix. And the two particle S matrix has this selection property, this selection rule. Um, so we can just restrict to that and then restrict it to that sector. This is, these are exactly the equations we have and where this, this is now a phase and this phase is just the phase S0 we discussed before and then we have S hat, uh, let's call it plus, 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 plus and S hat square, right? Where plus, 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 plus are uh, some particular, is some particular element of, uh, of this. So the, that W state corresponds to, let's say, SU2 is a boson, it's a product of two bosons, one for each SU2 slash two, and both, let's say, have charge plus, and that's why I put pluses everywhere. But anyway, so it's a known, it's a known function. Um, so in this way, you can start determining dimensions of operators, and, uh, and one other subsector, so this is sometimes called SU2 subsector, uh, because, uh, as I said, uh, for weak coupling, it corresponds to the SU2 
uh, Heisenberg spin chain. And there is the SL2 subsector, which uh, corresponds to C's and derivatives in one particular complex direction or, or combination of directions, C, which has definite uh, eigenvalues under the transverse uh, rotations. So this D plus, you can think of it as D1 plus I D2, OK? OK. Um, anyway, so that's some other subsector. The equations are identical. The only difference is that the indices that appear here are different. This is another part of the matrix. Slightly different indices, slightly different spectrum. OK? Um, and I wanted to end by saying that um, using uh, those equations, uh, particularly in this SL2 subsector, you can uh, compute the dimensions of operators of the form trace C D plus to the S C, okay? So in this case, you need to put lots and lots of derivatives, take the limit when, and you can take the limit when the number, when S goes to infinity, and in that limit, you can compute delta minus S going like uh, some gamma cusp of lambda times log of S, and you can compute uh, this anomalous dimension by uh, taking these beta equations. So what's the, what's the idea? Let's go slowly. We are, yeah. Ah, OK. Well, let me, let me just, shut, let me just uh, say what the idea is in maybe one minute. Um, you start with these beta equations for the SL2 subsector. Um, you have many, many particles. Sorry, here I forgot the factor of L or J. Um, so you start with these equations. Um, you take the limit when you have a large number of particles, a large number of impurities. We have S of them. You take a kind of continuum limit with a thermodynamic limit where you have many of these particles. You analyze these equations in the thermodynamic, this thermodynamic limit with many particles. Um, these equations in that limit turn into a single integral equation. And by um, solving it, you find uh, this cusp anomalous dimension. Okay. Okay, I'm done now. <laughs>